each other tonight, a little bit different setting from the past couple of weeks. The past couple of weeks, we've been doing couch conversations. I really like that, but I left it in the back for Legacy tonight. They're meeting here tonight. Legacy Youth Ministries are in the back. So if you are part of Legacy or your child is and you had not got them here yet, hey, you better hurry up. They're fixing to get started. So uh, feel free to come on in when you get here. Should we still tarry here? But uh, it is a blessing to be here today. I want to make a few quick announcements while people are getting the message that we are live. They'll be jumping on here in a minute, uh, conversating back and forth, I'm sure. Uh, but I do want to mention this, that we are going to a uh, we're going to a summer schedule of one service on Sundays. We're going to one service on Sunday. Uh, the 9 and 11 are going to be combined together uh, for a 10 o'clock service. The doors will open at 930. Service will start at 10 o'clock, and we will continue out that through the remainder of the summer. And that's due to people on vacation and ball schedules and whatnot back and forth. So we just want to accommodate the people and let them gather when we can for those who are not uh cxts have been working diligently through the pandemic uh they have been carrying two services and i applaud them for that the volunteers who greet you at the door who park you in the parking lot uh who pray for you at the altar or uh get you get you signed in here at new beginnings those people have been pulling doubles on sundays and i applaud them for doing so you are a great team fantastic for that um, but you can sit back and take a breath because we're going to do it one time on sundays here Pull up to the table and we're going to eat the same. So that the, the doors will open at 930. Church will start at 10 and we'll carry on throughout whenever, as the Lord leads there for one service on Sundays. So I just wanted to get that out there. God bless you. I'm glad to be with you, whether you're in this house or I'm in your house. Either one, I'm glad that we have come together. I'm going to talk a little different today, tonight. Um, try not to get into too much of a preach because I do want to teach you. Uh, I do want to teach you a thing today, uh, and that's some stuff that you don't hear taught in church and at pulpits much at all anymore, sanctification and holiness. Come on now. I hope you'll click in the like button and share buttons out there. Throw me here. It's a few of y'all hit. Throw me an amen if I hit a nerve every now and then. But sanctification and holiness is not taught in churches too much anymore. I believe because throughout the years we have pitched such a high standard between those two topics that nobody really even cares to stretch out there and try to get it anymore. Um, but I think the Lord's going to allow me to be able to bring those standards not down but to you so that you can understand them a little bit better. Uh, we will start out tonight in 1 Peter. I've been in 1 Peter all week. I can tell you I will be teaching of joy unspeakable and full of glory Sunday morning. Um, out of this same very same chapter in 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll be teaching that. But in the parameters of it, the Lord has brought me to a place of sanctification and holiness that we'll be teaching from and looking at. So why don't you go on in your Bible as I pray to 1 Peter chapter 1. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you and we commit ourselves before you, Lord. We lay ourselves on the altar. We lay, we lay, we lay the limits of our minds at your hands to stretch them tonight. God, would you mold our hearts tonight to hear your word and be obedient to your voice. We commend our time to you today in the name of Jesus. Have your way, Holy Spirit. You are the way maker. Not only the way maker, but you are the pot maker. We are just the pot and you're the potter. And we submit ourselves as clay to you that you would mold us and make us in what you want us to be tonight. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, first Peter chapter 1. Chapter 1. Uh, Peter's, Peter's preaching to some folks and teaching, uh, we'll see who that is, uh, over around Asia and Bithyn and Galatia. Uh, so verse 2 says, Elect um, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. I understand this is just the greeting that Peter is expressing to his audience and the congregation that he's speaking to, but I see that he has noted some things in sanctification right there. He says, he says the, the, the foreknowledge, the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Sanctification is the becoming, is the uh, the, the, the transforming of us from our old nature into our new nature. Forgiveness is instant. Forgive, he, he forgives us instantaneously, but, but he's building saints out of us. Come on, somebody. 
uh, I don't need to make, make, uh, make mention of saying who's perfect, who's not perfect, but I do speak of a, a spirit of excellence in this house, and that means that I don't expect you to have it all right right now. I just expect you to excel from here and go forward. That's what the spirit of excellence is, is to start here and to advance, to start here and to progress, to carry on. That's the spirit of excellence, and that's what sanctification does in our life, is that we start out, watch, with the lust of the flesh. We start out with the lust of the eye. We start out with the sinful nature that we were born into. But as Christ comes in with his spirit, the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit comes in and brings out the fruit, the fruits of the spirit. And they begin to watch, sanctify us. What's that mean? Make us more like saints. If, if I could use that picture that's already painted in your mind. Now, we have some, some folks in, in, in our neighborhoods, in our community who pray to saints. I'm not endorsing that today. I pray to Jesus. That's the only one I pray to. He's the only one who hears me. Everybody else has died. Jesus is the only one that's died and is risen. That's the one I pray to. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But I do believe that there's a process of the Spirit that sanctifies us and brings us more in line with the saints that the Bible speaks of, that brings us more in line with the ways of Christ. And that process is, 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 is completed and, and, and excelled by the fruits of the Spirit in our life. So when we ask Jesus into our life, he gives us stuff like joy. Joy makes us more like Jesus. He gives us stuff like love, where we couldn't love before. And that makes us more like the Spirit of God. You see the progress that's taking place, the, 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 the um, transformation that takes place, how he can take a sinner, he can take a sinner and convert them. Uh, well, so the, the blood of Christ purifies us. It, it purifies us and it, it, it sanctifies us as well. It's, it's a proven a realm of sanctification. We could go back and look in Exodus uh, whenever the death angel was going to be passing over the Israelites and the Egyptians. If there were blood over the doorpost, there was purification for the house and the death angel would pass over. Same as the so, so for our lives. As, as we uh, 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 apply the blood in our life and allow the sprinkling of Christ's blood over us or, or, or appreciate or accept what he's done on Calvary's cross, he has taken us and purified us and is sanctifying us. Our sanctification and our purification are the effects of consecration. Our sanctification and our purification are the effects of our consecration. That gets a little bit different. Sanctified is, is, proven, is to be proven as a saint. The blood purifies us and puts us in a place to allow the Spirit of God, as the, as the blood comes and purifies our life, then, then the Spirit can come and move in our lives. Because there's only one thing that can separate you from God, and that's sin. The Word says nothing can separate you from the love of God. That means He loves you even with sin in your life. He still loves you. But he can't stay where a sin is. He, can't, he couldn't look at Jesus on the cross because he had bore the sins of the world. He had to turn his head from even gazing upon the Son who has done everything for us to make sure there was a way and open up the spirit of adoption in our life. He, he couldn't even, the Father couldn't look at the Son because he, had, he carried the weight of the sins of the world upon him and he couldn't look at him. So sin separates us from the Spirit of God, but the blood of Jesus brings the purification in our life that allows the Spirit to begin to come and manifest in the fruits of the Spirit, and that brings sanctification in our lives. I hope this is dawning on you and you're understanding a little bit more here about the sanctification process. And as, as we look, I've been talking a little bit about Galatians 5 and 2, I mean 5 and 22, um, the, the, the love, the joy, the long-suffering, the faithfulness, the gentleness. Um, I want you to understand that that is fruits of the Spirit, but you can't have the fruits of the Spirit unless you've invited the Spirit to come into your life. It doesn't just happen. You have to intend on it happening. You have to, you, there are some times that we have to make the decision that, all right, I'm in a spot. Am I going to let the Spirit bring joy? Or am I going to go the way I feel? All right, I'm in this situation. I, I, they, they're not acting like they ought to act, but I'm supposed to love them. Am I going to let the Spirit come in and bring love? 
Or am I going to go on with the way I feel in the flesh that I wanted and my desires? Do I make room? Do I anticipate? Do I intentionally grow with the fruits of the Spirit? So as I allow the Spirit to come in and have fruit in my life, then I reach another step in the, in the process of sanctification. Let's back up down that road a little bit because here's the deal. We start looking at consecration. Consecration comes from the word of holiness. Okay, if I'm going to talk for a few minutes, I'm not going to be too long with you today. I'm about halfway through right now, but I think I got enough for you to be able to chew on. Holiness is where it starts. Holiness is not when I get to heaven. Let's, let's continue on. Let's, let, let, me, let me read this before I get too far ahead of myself because I want to come back and catch holiness. So, so, so in his greeting, Peter was saying the sanctification process begins with the blood of Christ and the purification that comes from that. And that sanctification begins to move in our life or begins to progress in our lives and we progress towards it. Here's some, here's some, uh, some, some, some standards for you to look at. Verse 13, the same chapter says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Gird up the loins of your mind. What he's saying is keep your mind in control. Uh, the word Paul wrote said, listen, cast down all those thoughts that exalt their self against the knowledge of Christ. Move that out of there. You, we've got to keep our mind. Can I just talk to you for just a minute about your mind? Your mind seems to be where it all starts. It's the biggest battlefield of your life is in your mind. Uh, Sister Joyce Meyer has done a whole teaching one time on the battlefield of the mind. That's because from your mind comes a thought. A thought turns into a belief, and a belief will turn into a behavior. And a behavior will turn into a habit. And before you know it, your life has gone the way of your mind. So if you don't keep your mind together, excuse me, if you don't gird up the loins of your mind and remain sober, then we will allow our lives to follow the lust of the flesh, the desires of the sinful nature that we were born with. He says, uh, from the form of verse 14, it says, As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust. Peter is telling us that there's a transition between what we were born in a sinful nature to being what Christ has purified and sanctified us to be. There's a line. We've got to learn to draw a line in the sand and say, hey, this was the old me. This is the new me. There's no one. Or, the word says because you're lukewarm, he'll spew you out. You cannot be the old you and the new you. It doesn't work. Either you're a new creation or you're still the old creation. You don't hear this preached in church a whole lot because we like to be seeker friendly and we like people to come back next week with their big tithes and offerings. That's what we do, just to be honest with you. And, but, but that's not getting us the power of the church, of God that we need in the church house today. I'm a believer in a time of pandemic. I'm a believer in a time of rioting in the street that the people are looking for the power of God. One divine demonstration of the power of God in a church will change the whole situation. Listen, one movement, one, one, one little shift of the kingdom of God showing up changes the whole community, changes the whole atmosphere. But we, the church doesn't have the power to do that because we won't draw a line in the sand and say, this is not sanctified. This is lust. This is sanctification. This we should not do. This we should do. Nobody wants to draw the line in the sand anymore because we want a soft line like everywhere else and everybody gets a trophy in our situations. This is hard preaching, but I'm, I'm interested in raising up people who are going to not just look at Facebook, but who are going to get ready to go on and get in somebody else's face and help write their book. Come on, somebody. Help me out. Why, while you're in writing books, you ought to write your chapter right here. Call it sanctification and stop some of the foolishness that we've been letting fly under the radar. Let's talk about this for a minute. Holiness. Holiness is an intended lifestyle. Sanctification is a process that the Spirit comes in and sanctifies you. But holiness is an intended lifestyle. I'll, 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 let me... Uh, let, let me bring it to you at the, the most elementary level. Holiness meaning consecrated. Consecrated meaning set apart or, 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 or stand out or different. Um, is very awkward. Let me bring you to the most basic decision that you make that starts the whole process. When the preacher's preaching and he gets finished and he says, Now, 
if you want to accept Jesus, how awkward. Do you remember how awkward it was the first time that you had to step out in that aisle? Watch, when everybody else stayed in their chairs and you had to get up and turn loose your chair and step out, that's consecration. That's when, whenever, whenever everybody else is doing one thing and you stand out and do something different, that is consecration. Now, we can use different levels depending on how churchy you want to get, but I needed to use that example right there because it's the most elementary. The moment that we consecrate ourselves to be able to do watch what God told us to do instead of what everybody else is doing, God says when you consecrate yourself, put yourself on the side and say, hey, God, I'm ready for you to do what you want to do. I'm stepping out in this aisle, and I'm coming up to the front, and I'm getting ready to start this. God has started the purification process, and therefore the sanctification has started taking place. That's as simple as I know how to be able to help you understand holiness and living a lifestyle of holiness is being able to step out and do something different that other folk aren't doing. Gird up the lawns of your mind. Don't go back to the former lusts and conduct, conduct yourselves. In verse 17, it said, conduct yourselves throughout this time of your stay in fear. Conduct yourselves correctly. But I want to jump back in verse 16. He says, uh, verse 15, we'll start. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. That gets real. I don't want to say I lost anybody, but that gets to be a tight spot to where you don't know uh Folks start looking at you because holy is such a scary word these days. Uh, and I believe it's because we've gotten so far away from the way we know we were raised and we've just allowed this to creep in and that to creep in to where we don't live a lifestyle of holiness anymore. We just kind of live a lifestyle of hope I get to heaven now. That's, that's what we do. But if we're going to see the power of God move, it's going to come through sanctified believers who believe God can do it. Sanctification comes from consecration that causes us to be able to step out, and that is holiness. Let me help you understand what it is and what it's not. So I gave you a good example of what it is. What it is not is, here's a good example. Let me turn to Levit Leviticus. Leviticus 11 and 44. Excuse me, 11, 11 and 44 says, For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves, and you shall be holy. For I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourself with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I'm not sure what he's saying about creeping things and, and things that creep on the earth. I'm not sure if he's talking about snakes or salamanders or if he's talking about catfish. I'm not real sure. And that has been the de delay in our society these days is that we forgot the first part that he says, be holy as I am holy. And then we went straight to staying away from stuff, making laws against stuff. And I think that's where people got a bad taste of holiness in their mouth is that it's not really holiness just because I told you to stay away from this. Stay away from that. Don't cut your hair. Don't wear pants. Don't put on makeup. Don't, don't, don't wear short sleeves. Don't, don't drink. Don't dip. Don't do this. Don't do that. that, that and just on and on. And I got young people dropping out of church because they don't even know what they can do. I believe we've missed it and we went straight to the laws and forgot the principle of what God was trying to tell us is to be holy because he's holy. He says, be holy because you're made in my image and I made you that way. Listen, it's not a real strenuous task for you to be holy. The strenuous part is to being able to deny yourself and accept him. Be holy as I am holy. We look at God Almighty and we say, oh my God, he's got angels floating around him singing day and night. and We're just not worthy to come to the throne. That's a lie. The word, word of God says that you can come boldly to the throne of God because of what Christ has done. All of it's been a lie that you're not worthy to come to the throne. You are definitely, if anybody or anything is worthy to come to the throne, it's a child of God. Because we learned in Romans this week that because of the spirit of adoption, we are no longer slaves. We're not even coming to the throne to serve. We coming because we are sons. We coming because that's where daddy sits. We coming because that's where our father is. We deserve a spot there because of the blood of Jesus and his sanctification in our life. We 
can be holy. Question is, is do you want to be? Question now, it's, it, no longer is the question, can you be holy? You were made in the image of God. You were made in a holy image. Question now is, is do you want to consecrate yourself to the level that God's calling you to? See, it gets tight whenever the preacher's not telling you everything that's going to make you holy. And I throw it right back on your lap and say, you hear God tell you what's going to make you holy. There's a whole different demand on the relationship right there. As for, uh, It's easy for me to come and read to you in black and white and say, do this, do this, do this. Don't do that. Stay away from that, and then you'll be holy. It's another thing when I ask you to, when you wake up in the morning, put your knees on the floor and ask God, what do you do today? That's what makes you holy. That's what continues the sanctification process in your life. You could have sat in that chair and not done anything and not consecrated, never stood out, never stepped out, never got away from the norm, never came up and accepted Jesus, but you never started the process of purification, sanctification, and holiness. Holiness puts us in the position to receive the purification and the sanctification. You mean you're going to be holy first? Yeah, you're going to be holy first. You're already made in the image of God. What he wants you to do before anything is to hear his voice and respond. So while you're sitting there wondering if you will, if I give my life to Jesus tonight, what am I going to do tomorrow night? Well, then, then you've not quite made the decision to honor what God's asked you to do yet. Hey, and that's cool. I hope you don't run out of time. I'll let you know the heavy price when you run out of time. You don't want to run out of time, and we never know when he's coming. So you need to respond to consecration so that he can start the purification and sanctification in your life. Because hell's hot and it's forever. And I don't back up off of that any at all, none at all. So um, I want to get back to being able to, to, to bring it down the specifics and the simplicity of holiness. Holiness is you doing what God's asked you to do. Holiness is not the law that you learned in a church. Holiness is not the law that some man would write for you. Holiness is what have you heard God tell you to do. Have you put yourself in the position of consecrating yourself so that God can purify and sanctify? Listen, he only has to purify one time if you're open for it. But sanctification, I believe, is a continual process. You don't wake up one day and, hey, and you're already sanctified. I believe every day you re reach another level of sanctification as you walk and you submit yourselves to Christ, to, to Christ and allow the Spirit to come and be fruitful in your life. I know I'm saying some of the stuff over and over again, but just to give you a couple examples before we do close out tonight, is, is let's take Jesus. Jesus was at the, at the throne of God, and, and God said, I'm going to send him. I've I'm, I'm, I'm sent my only begotten son to come and do this right here. And when Jesus walked the face of the earth, he set himself apart. He consecrated himself. That don't mean he prayed 24 hours a day. I don't mean he wrote books on sanctification and holiness and how long to wear your hair and how short to cut it. He, he didn't come here and write all those laws. As a matter of fact, the only laws that he really quoted was because he was in the church house where people could only deal, identify with the law, so he would read it back to them and say, I am he who's come to fulfill this. Other than that, he said, I've come to preach the kingdom of the Father. I've come to, that his kingdom would be fulfilled. I've come to seek first the kingdom of God. So every morning, every time I, I wake, every, every move that I make, I'm asking him, what do you want me to do in this situation? It don't mean I've got to put on sackcloth and ashes and go over here and consecrate myself. If he told you to do it, do it. But that don't mean you have to do it unless he's told you to do it. But the example I'm making is Jesus done what the Father asked him to do. That consecrated him. That put him in a position of holiness that set him up for sanctification. Let's look at just a couple more before we close out tonight. Peter. Peter, the one who denied Jesus three times at one night, who then reminded and turned back. That same Peter was in a boat. And Jesus came to him walking on the water. Defying gravity, he's standing on water. Men don't stand on water by the laws of nature. They don't, that's, that's not what happens. That is not the way it goes. That's defying the laws of nature when Jesus comes out there. And Peter says, I want to defy those laws too. And watch what Jesus told him. Well, he didn't. Let me paraphrase. Jesus, Jesus uh, paraphrased in Bradley's translation is, you can't do it in the boat. 
you cannot walk on the water and stand in the boat. You cannot be safe in the boat and walk on the water and defy gravity. You cannot be safe within the confines of the black and white written word and expect to see me move supernaturally into your life. You have to step out of the confines and safety that has been built around you and consecrate yourself. Go where nobody else is going. Watch this. The rest of them stayed in the boat and watched Peter step out on the water. Jesus, said, Peter said, can I come? Jesus said, if you'll get out the boat, if you'll get away from that safety, if you'll get away from that secure place, you know what? Sometimes we don't pray because, not because God didn't ask us, but sometimes we don't pray for our stranger because we don't know if they'll accept us. You won't ever know if you don't ask them. You will and then watch this, you will never see God heal their life and change their life if you don't pray. But you will never pray if you don't ask them. You, never, you will never walk on the water standing in the boat. Consecration is getting out of the boat, separating from everybody, and doing what God's asked you to do. That is holiness. It lines you up for pur purification and sanctification. Not so much purification. Can I reiterate that? That purification comes whenever you've accepted Jesus and he begins to move in your life. Salvation is then, and I believe you're saved. And I, I believe that you can even go a life not doing a whole lot for God, but he, his love is enough that he'll still save you. I really believe that. I believe. Now, he did say those who love me obey my commandments. He did say that. So if he commands you to do something, it's hard for you to tell me you love him and not obeying his commandments. That's the word. But I do believe that his love and his saving grace can overlook the wrongdoings that we may do or the hard-headedness that we walk through in life for our salvation. But we will never experience the full power of God without the sanctification that comes from consecration by putting ourselves in a position of holiness. It's tight in here, but that's all right. I, I expected it that way. I hope you're soaking it up. I hope you're taking some notes. I hope you're giving some likes, some thumbs up, maybe some shares. I got one more. So Peter, Peter can't do what God's called and what Jesus has called him to do sitting in the boat. He has to get out, step out from away among those. Samson. Samson has a supernatural strength that is just unknown and unheard of in men in that day and time. Samson was a man. Uh, I don't even see where it says that he was in great stature. It just said he was real strong. We don't know that God didn't take an average-sized man and give him supernatural strength. We, we don't know that. What, what we do know is he had strength that men couldn't reckon. But what we also know is there were some times in Samson's life that he wouldn't consecrate himself as he had before. Because his mom said, the Lord told his mom, don't ever touch a razor to his hair. Here again, don't get caught up in cutting hair. God said is the thing. God said the obedience of God's word. Oh, listen, if, if you want to cut up with me, I'll tell you, if you get in the word too deep, you'll cut your own self. Because the very same verses that says don't have a tattoo says don't shave either. So if you're going to cut up with people with tattoos and you're going to shave, y'all in the same boat. You really don't want to get into the law because it's going to cut you before it's over. The best thing for you to do is stay in the relationship and hear what God said. God wasn't worried about how long Samson's hair got. God was worried that his mom and dad was going to be obedient to the word. And because they would be obedient, this child would be a Nazarene. Because of that, he would be able to put the strength on him that he called. Just because of the obedience, it said, I'm going to consecrate. I mean, I don't know how little Samson looked with a ponytail and all the rest of the little boys had haircuts. I, I don't know. Did the other little boys even have haircuts? We, we don't know. I mean, there wasn't many stylists back in the day. I'm not sure what the Philistines did for getting their hair done and nails did and all that kind of stuff. I, we, we don't even know. But can, can, I see, can I show you just how silly that gets when we start worried about the cosmetics and not the principles that God's trying to teach us? He wasn't worried about how long the locks were in Samson's head, he was worried about the obedience of his fathers and the obedience of Samson to be able to carry it two generations deep. They said, God said he'd do this if I'd stay away from that. I better stay away from it. Problem is, he won't lay his head, his head in the lap of Delilah and let her cut his hair. He lay, Hey, sleep with the enemy, however you want to say it. He was, he was in a situation that he probably should not have been in because he ended up dealing with some stuff that he shouldn't have had to be dealing with. And it cost him the divine power that God had on his life because God said, if you can consecrate yourself and stay in this place of holiness, then I can continue this realm 
uh, this, I can advance the process of sanctification and put you in the position that I've called you to be. Keep your head out of the lap of Delilah and don't sleep with the enemy and don't fool with your hair. Hear what I got to say. And God says, I can continue to do what Samson do? Exactly what he shouldn't have done. Slept with the enemy. They cut his hair, bound him up, plucked his vision out of his head. All of those things. That can preach for days right there. But the whole deal was is that if he would have remained in that place of consecration, that place of holiness, he could still be walking in sanctification and experiencing the power of God in the earth. Can I encourage you as I close out tonight this midweek service, can I, can I encourage you to not get caught up in the do's and the don'ts, but be caught up in your relationship with God? What's that mean? When I say God, I mean the Trinity. When I say God, I mean all of them. If you don't like the word Trinity because it ain't in the Bible, okay, that's cool. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Be, be open to those three speak, those three entities speaking into your life. I believe they all three are one. I believe they all together uh, make up the Godhead that we serve, and that's what we confess here at New Beginnings Outreach. When I baptize, I baptize in all of them, not just Jesus, not just the Holy Ghost, not just Jehovah, in all of us, because I'd like to know God in every aspect that we, can, we could possibly know him, and I encourage you to do so. So whenever he speaks a thing to your life, be obedient. Because holiness and consecration is not the place that the pastor tells you to get. It's the place that God's called you to. If he says dress in sackcloth and ashes and lay around for three days and pray for me and wait and tarry till I show up, do it. If he says fast, do it. If he says don't drink coffee, don't drink coffee. If he says cut your hair, cut it. If he says don't, don't. Wear what God tells you to wear. Wear what you think God's, God is instructing you to wear. If you don't have a clear definition, make sure you're modest and covered. Don't cause your brother to fall and slip and stumble. That's some pretty good guidelines. But for a place of holiness, follow the instruction of the Holy Spirit that will tell you this is the place of holiness for you. Consecrate yourself and do it. And as you do it, just like being saved, the purification process starts. Forgiveness is instant. The sin is gone. Purification comes. And the sanctification, the life of the Spirit can come alive in your life. And before you know it, those dead, dry branches of your life will soon be fruitful in the kingdom of God. Hope I've challenged you tonight. Hope you have a little better understanding of sanctification and holiness. I know I don't have it all. I'm sure there's some who's going to try to nitpick it and pull it apart, but that's all right. If those who would chew on it and spit out the bones, I think you'll grow and it'll be enough nutrition for you for the week. Continue to, to go. I want to encourage you to make sure that, that you hear God and live a lifestyle of holiness, a lifestyle of holiness, and then allow the Spirit to do the sanctifying. You will never be good enough. It's the blood of Jesus that makes us good enough. You'll never be right enough. It's His righteousness. But, but our obedience can set us up in the position to be able to receive what God wants to do in our life next. Amen? Praise the Lord. Thank you for allowing me in your house. Thank you for those who joined me tonight. Um, God bless you. Uh, another quick reminder before I close out is remember, we are going to one service Sunday morning. It will open up at 930. Service will start at 10. Uh, I welcome you out to come and be a part. We do have these chairs socially distanced. It may not look like it, but every other row is backed up to the other with six foot between them. Um, so, so we are correcting that. We do have overflow in the back. Should that be an issue Sunday morning, we will make sure of that. Uh, there's hand sanitizer. Wear a mask. Feel free if you need to. And begin to pray. My message tonight on sanctification and holiness was not just because I wanted something to preach. We are in a situation to where people are letting their guards down of the viruses and plagues that the enemies tried to put on us. And if we don't put ourselves in a place of sanctification and holiness, we will not see this broke off of America. America has got to come back to true holiness and sanctification so that we can see the power of God move because God can't move on disobedient people. God moves on obedient people. God moves on people who want to move, who want to respond to him and do as he leads. So uh, let's, let's start focusing on that. Pray for your neighbors. Don't condemn them because they're not as holy as you are, but pray for them and lift them up that our... our our nation as a whole would come back to the holiness of God and be obedient to his consecrated efforts. Amen.
Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these people. I thank you for allowing me to be able to teach them tonight. Holy Spirit, I want to tell you thank you for coming in, for it's not the knowledge that I have nor the studies that I have, but your divine inspiration. Holy Spirit, I give myself to you even as we leave today. I commit these people who are in the viewing audience, those who are in attendance, I pray your heads of protection over them. Spirit, would you guide them? Would you lead them? Teach them in all ways of consecrated places and moments of their life and how they can be more obedient, how we can walk a little closer to you, God, so that we can experience the true sanctification of the Spirit of God in our life. We honor you and bless you. We tell you, thank you, Holy Spirit, for being here tonight. Now go with us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. See you Sunday morning. Doors open at 930. Service starts at 10.